Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. And today I want to look at the issue of direct perception and the work of James Gibson. And this is something, you know, I've covered a lot on the podcast. You know, I don't think it's something we can cover too much because as I've tried to emphasize, you know, in in my skill acquisition videos and some of the podcast, this is the very roots of the differences between the skill acquisition process, the, the skill acquisition approaches, right? This is the roots of the tree that gives the differences between how we train athletes, the different technologies we can use for training, the different methods we use, and, and so on, right? This is the roots of the tree. It, it leads to the branches and how they, they grow up. And, and, you know, in my podcast, here's a couple places I've talked about this, you talked about the nature of direct perception um, in, in, way back in episode 20C and also in my series on, on James Gibson. So I think direct perception is something that I think with each pass, you gain a little more understanding of what Gibson meant, right? It seems easy. But there, there's a there's a lot to it. There's some subtleties to it. So I think it's really good to keep reviewing this. And for this, I want to talk about this wonderful article that uh, Bill Warren. So Bill Warren is, you know, as I've talked about before, is one of my favorite researchers in in perception action. And yeah, I interviewed him. I was lucky to interview him on the podcast a couple months ago. And I love his papers. He's one of the best communicators of ecological psychology. I think there is. He's very. Uh, thoughtful and how he explains things and use great examples. And this is a paper he wrote for a special issue of the journal Perception on Gibson, Gibson's approach, right? And it's called Information is Where You Find It, Perception is an Ecologically Well-Posed Problem. And I'm going to go through some of this, but I really recommend you read it. You know, I don't use this word often with, for a research paper, but it's delightful. I love the way Bill puts things and and examples he uses. Some of them are quite complicated, warning, but you know I think he does a great job explaining it. So what are we talking about here? The, as it, as the title uh, implies, what Bill is is using is the idea of perception as a problem, right? And the traditional view of perception, right, is that perception is an ill-posed problem. Okay. Well, here's what we mean by that, right? So what we mean by that, first of all. The, one of the fundamental differences between direct and indirect perception, and as I said, the skill acquisition approaches that follow, is what is the perceptual system trying to do? What is its goal? What is its problem? Right In the traditional indirect view, the problem that the visual system and the perceptual system is trying to solve is it's trying to recover the properties of the world around you from the images, from the stimuli, if we focus just on vision, from the image on your retina, right? So it's trying to recover depth, material properties like slant, illumination, uh, texture, and so on from this 2D image on the back of your eye. And when you think about it that way, it's not surprising that we think of this problem as ill-posed. By that we mean there's simply not enough image information in that image to recover all of that, right? For example, the image on your eye is 2D, the world is 3D, right? So the image on your eye, the sensation, right, is not enough to know to, to, for perception if this is what its problem is trying to solve, right? If its goal is to recover the properties of the world and recreate this kind of representation of it, there's not enough information there, right? So we can't just have sensation. We also need perception, right, where we bring in elaboration, processing of the information, prior knowledge, and so on. We need to enhance this information because perception is indirect. The not enough information in the, the image the, the, to solve the problem. It's like solving in math, trying to solve an equation where you're not given enough variables, right? You have to guess, you have to add to it, right? So that's what Bill means by the assumption that perception is an ill prose problem. And this is what Gibson was faced with when he first started working too. Of course, this was the dominant view. And for Gibson, there was a few problems with it, right? If you turn, if perception requires prior knowledge, right? If the, if we stick to vision, if the visual Im image is ambiguous and there's no way in to interpret it without prior knowledge, elaborating on it, then where, how can we ever get that prior knowledge, right? So we can't perceive until we have prior knowledge. We can't have prior knowledge till we perceive. How could this system ever develop? 
And Gibson's quote, knowledge of the world cannot be explained by supposing that knowledge of the world already exists, right? It's a totally circular argument, right? We can't, if we can't, perception is indirect. How do we even start, right? Is, and that's the, the problem that the thing that Gibson didn't like, right? Um, you, you, you're you lost right from the beginning, right? You can't, you, there's no way you can start. It, so, and this is going to be a common theme in Bill's view, and, and it's mine too. It's one of the reasons I kind of <clears throat> have changed my view over my career is I really don't think of the indirect explanations solve anything. Okay, and we'll talk about that a little more as we go along. So what's Gibson's answer? Gibson's answer is um, that perception is not ill-posed, it's well-posed. And the key to Gibson's direct perception, one of the key things about it, there's two parts to it. One, first of all, he completely changes the goal of perception, right? The problem it's trying to solve. Perception is not trying to recover the physical properties of the outside world. It's not trying to recreate the world in your head. It's trying to pick up information you can use to act and achieve your goals. That's it. Everything else is irrelevant, right? If something in the outside world is not relevant to your goal, it, who cares <laughs> what the material properties are, or the depth or the distance, right? So the problem of perception is to pick up action relevant information. It's not to reconstruct the outside world. The second pillar to his, his view is, and this is all from Bill's description I'm using, in, in, you know, is specification, right? The idea, okay, we need these action relevant properties. In the environment, there is information that directly specifies them, okay? All we have to do is educate our attention and find them, okay? So there's variables in our environment like tau, like all the ones that I talk about all the time that are informative of, about behavioral relevant properties within the constraints of an animal's environment. They do not require any elaboration, prior knowledge, right? There's information that directly specifies what we need, okay? Thus, perception is not ill-posed. There's not, a, not, it's not missing variables. If you just change what the problem of perception is, then it's ecologically well-posed, right? Perception can be direct, right? It doesn't require this indirect view, right? And I really love the way Bill puts this in terms of this problem. I think it's a great way to understand direct perception, okay? So from this, Gibson came up with the idea of information, right? The function of vision is not to solve the inverse problem and reconstruct a vertical description of the physical world, right? We're not trying to recreate all the elements of the world in our head, okay? He, Gibson's, as Bill puts it, Gibson's fundamental contribution to the field of perception and all the other things it's spun off into is, <clears throat> this is the reason why we call it ecological psychology, right? Bill, um, as Bill says, Gibson naturalized perception. He put it back in the world, right? So the indirect view is that perception is a logical problem that a computer is solving. Gibson put it, perception is in the world. It's adaptive behavior in terms of our environment, okay? So we're keeping in contact with behavioral relevant properties from our niche, our environment we live in. We're not trying to solve some abstract problem or recreate the outside world, right? And that's Gibson's idea of what information is. Information is action relevant in, to our, in, in the animal's environment, right? That's where the ecological comes from. So what is information, right? Information is higher order spatial temporal patterns. So what that means is we're not going to likely to be able to control actions. We're not just going to be able to pick up simple visual features like the size of an object. It's going to be a higher order, you know, tau, the rate of change of an object divided by the rate of change, the size of an object divided by the rate of change of size. Okay. So they're higher order properties that are relevant within the constraints, right? So I love that Bill is tying in the, the constraints here, right? Um, information is relevant to what your environment is. There's not general purpose information, right? There's not, we do not process things for general purpose. We process things specific to the constraints of the exact environment we are, we're in. That's why we learn simple rules, right? To perform an action. 
That's why, you know, if you use a pitching machine where the speed is the same every time, a batter is going to latch on to one source of information versus if you vary the speeds, right? Information is relevant to the constraints of the particular niche. Specific to means that the patterns are unequivocally related to the property we're interested in for controlling our actions. And this specificity is what distinguishes Gibson's information from probabilistic cues, right? And as an example, I was talking with someone the other day about the similarities between behaviorism, you know, Skinner training his dogs to salivate, and the ecological approach. And while there's some things, the key difference is that in behaviorism, the, the stimulus can be anything, right? I can train a dog to salivate to a ringing bell. A ring bell is a, a, a cue, right? It's it's abstract thing that you've learned to associate. Information, it's not information. A bell is not information, right? Information is a property of the environment that tells us action relevant thing, right? It's not a cue that we've learned to associate, all right? So, so those are some of the kind of key points that Bill pulls out. And from this, he gives some examples from his own work, from uh, some other areas. You know, one of the main examples he talks about is optic flow, which I've talked about a lot about on the podcast. I, you know, the idea that as we move through our environment, we create this information through the, the pattern of flow of other objects across our eye. The, the, from this, we can pick up higher order variables about our speed, about our heading, right? So we control, a, a bird control, it's flying. Uh, we can land a plane without having to reconstruct the physical layout of the world. We don't need to know how long the runway is or how far away it is or what you know, size it is. We pick up the optic flow, the higher order information that's relevant to what we're trying to do, land in the middle of it. We don't have, we're not trying to reconstruct the world. And as an example of this, I would point you to, there's this wonderful video uh, episode PBS did on the, the Nova series where they showed Experiments people have done by manipulating the optic flow of birds and getting them to turn and fly faster. And so I, I would have a look at that if you're interested. It's a really great uh, video. Um, so that's information, right? So that's one piece of Gibson's contribution, the direct perception of information, right? Next, Bill goes on to talk about the other main thing, right? That Bill, that Gibson added, of course, affordances, right? This is the, the idea that we're not just picking up information, right? We're not just picking up things about how soon something's going to be there or how far away it is, um, whether it's reachable. We're picking up things that are not just information. We're picking up properties that are expressed relative to our, the abilities of the animal, okay? So a, an affordance is a higher order information that specifies the relationship between an environmental property and the animal that the properties that constitu constitute it, right? So it's not, we're not just perceiving a time, distance, size, right? We're perceiving things, you know, is something reachable for us? Can I, can I get there in time for me, right? So it, the affordance is essentially bringing in, not just adding to the information, telling us about environmental properties we care about, for controlling action, now we're bringing in relevant relative to our capabilities and our uh, body, right? So that's the critical part of the affordance, right? So one the way that we achieve this this relationship uh, between the environment, animal and the environment, right, is through body and action scaling, right? So affordances are not based on pr just prior knowledge of one's body or motor or ability. They're perceived directly because what we actually perceive is scaled by our body and our action capabilities, right? So hills look steeper when you you uh, are more tired or carrying a heavy load, kind of the embodied perception idea. This scaling, rather than occurring through stored, you know, memories of, of our, our, our information, is occurs by through calibration, right? We calibrate optical variables by exploring our environment in context-specific experience. Okay, so the key point here is information is not just telling us about environment property, imp environmental properties. It's telling about the relationship between these environmental properties and the animal's action system, our motor control system, right? This relationship, right? That's the key idea of the affordance. And Bill goes on to give some great examples, right, from his own work. 
This is work when we he looked at people walking through a gap. So they, they had to walk through a door. The door got more and more narrow. He looked at when people turned the rotate rotated their shoulders. So they went through it sideways. What we find is if you look at a small person versus a large person, you you look at the timing, it's different, right? The affordances are different, but not if you scale it relative to their body, right? So if you scale the size of their aperture rel relative to their shoulder width, they do the exact same thing, right? And you get the same thing with people uh, passing under low th bridges, right? And the reason we get that is is shown in the uh, in the the uh, caption here is that what we're doing is we're perceiving our world in 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 units that are scaled by our, our action capabilities or body. In this case, in terms of eye heights, and you can look at my episode on calibration for more on that. Right. Um, so here's this kind of same example again of going it through a gap. Um, also, uh, for more on kind of the action scale. So those are kind of more body scaling, scaling perception in terms of your physical height, width, uh, ex uh, leg length and so on. Um, I recently covered a study that looked at scaling your perception in terms of an action ability. In this case, it was a goalkeeper's movement time, how quick they could get to the corner of the net. Right. So we can look at that as well. There's some nice research on that. So to kind of conclude, right, uh, Gibson, as Gibson foresaw, you know, the pro, the issue he had with the traditional way people were looking at perception in his time is that um, we, when we, um, we, if we begin with thinking about in terms of what we're trying to do, our actions, our goals, we can find there's information that specifies this directly and relative to our capacity. Information is in the environment. It's where you find it, right? It's when you take into account the constraints and the goal of the animals. And Bill uh, suggests that, you know, through his examples, and he gives lots of nice other examples from other animals, a narwhal, or really uh, detecting the water. Um, there's wildly different, there's this information, we just have to kind of hunt for it, okay? Um, when we start with the presumption, you know, so we just had to kind of have to hunt for this information. And Bill also raises the the kind of thing you hear in ecological psychology a lot. Um, and I, I really believe this, as I said myself, this is one of the reasons I've kind of changed my view, okay? If you appeal to representation or internal model, right, you're assuming that perception is the ill-posed problem, right, that there's not enough information in the environment, it's essentially giving up, right? It's it's just um, you you know you're you're removing that you're just displacing the problem to another place, but you're kind of giving up on trying to solve it in a much more parsimonious and effective way by identifying information. Okay, so as Gib Bill concludes his hypothesis that perception is not an ill-posed indirect reconstruction problem; it's a well-posed ecological in our niche problem then this holds out hope that we can really ground perceptual science and, and even skill acquisition in natural laws rather than always re appealing to these representations and internal models that we don't really understand, okay? So I think, as I said, this is a wonderful article. It's a really great way to, I think, further your understanding of direct perception and affordances and things like that. So I would definitely recommend that you read it. Um, that's it for now. Uh, Again, you can support the podcast uh, by looking at and my, all the videos I do by going to patreon.com, Perception Action. Thanks for joining me, and cheers for now.